prazer estar aqui com vocês. Como vocês sabem, a Universidade Presbiteriana Mackenzie é confessional, é cristã, é presbiteriana, é reformada, de origem reformada. Então, os eventos sempre têm um momento devocional, um momento em que a gente, muito rapidamente, pede que Deus abençoe os eventos, as pessoas, as coisas que estão acontecendo no Mackenzie. Eu fiquei feliz quando recebi o e-mail dizendo que este era um evento de um seminário né, de histórias, de roteiros, de roteiristas, alguma coisa assim. Primeiro porque o meu cunhado já trabalha aqui no Mackenzie há mais de 20 anos como roteirista da TV Mackenzie, o Marcelo Dias da Silva. É, é meu cunhado. Segundo, porque a minha filha, e esse também é um evento da pós-graduação, de história, fez esse mestrado aqui. A Patrícia. Se formando há uns dias atrás, aí, uns, uns, uns dois, três anos atrás, no mestrado. Então, eu fiquei muito feliz. E, e terceiro, porque eu posso compartilhar muito rapidamente com vocês o fato de que é, Deus é, sem dúvida nenhuma, o maior roteirista que já existiu. O roteiro de Deus a gente pode ver na criação, a gente pode ver nas coisas que Deus é, criou, um roteiro maravilhoso, um design inteligente, um roteiro de criação, como nunca visto, a palavra de Deus diz isso, lá em Gênesis, capítulo 1, a partir do versículo 1, quando diz, no princípio criou Deus os céus e a terra, criou todas as coisas, e o texto segue, e vai dizendo que Deus... É, criou a luz, Deus criou, portanto, é, o universo, as galáxias, as estrelas, o sol, uma estrela de quinta grandeza ainda, existem é, sóis, estrelas muito maiores, vai dizendo que Deus criou os planetas, Deus criou o tempo e diz lá que é, chamou Deus a luz de dia, e as trevas de noite, e houve tarde e manhã, e o primeiro dia, Deus é o autor e é o criador do tempo, num roteiro é, maravilhoso, perfeito, um roteiro em que todo o universo está debaixo do poder criador, da soberania criadora é, do nosso Deus. E o texto segue e vai dizendo que Deus criou todas as coisas, Deus criou... A, a terra e toda a vida na terra e o próprio é, ser humano e vai mostrando como esse roteiro que Deus estabeleceu a partir dele mesmo, que nós não entendemos como, porque Deus não foi criado, Deus já existia, é pré-existente antes de todas as coisas e o Criador de todas as coisas, e aí nós não sabemos, não temos é, inteligência para compreender tamanha grandiosidade vai dizendo que Deus, então, o Criador, se tornou também um Deus Redentor. E o texto vai dizendo que Deus resolveu buscar o homem. Deus resolveu se relacionar com o homem, tabernacular com o homem, morar com o homem, através de Cristo Jesus, a partir de Cristo Jesus. Então, é, é muito legal, é muito bacana compartilhar isso na abertura desse seminário, desse trabalho com vocês, de um Deus que é o maior roteirista que já existiu na face da terra, de um Deus que fez um roteiro de criação e de redenção perfeito, maravilhoso. E o meu convite ao término dessa rápida devocional é que você conheça é, esse roteirista maravilhoso que é Deus, que você conheça a Deus também, e que você se relacione com Ele, porque com certeza, através do seu amor, da sua graça, e da sua misericórdia, Ele quer se relacionar com você também. Que Deus abençoe vocês, que Deus abençoe o seminário, as palestras, eu não posso ficar, já tenho um compromisso, tem alguém me aguardando já para atender, mas que Deus abençoe, abençoe esses dias de palestras, de estudos, abençoe a palestrante de hoje, abençoe a todos, é, no nome de Jesus Cristo. Eu vou pedir licença para fazer uma rápida oração, e depois pedir licença para me retirar. Deus de amor, muito obrigado, Pai, porque nós podemos ter certeza de que Tu és um Deus que existe, que é pessoal, um Deus que criou todas as coisas, todo o universo, o nosso planeta, as nossas vidas, 
um Deus criador de tudo e de todas as coisas, pelo amor e pela tua soberana vontade. Abençoa, Deus, a tua criação através de nós, teus filhos. Abençoa todos os que aqui estão nessa noite e este evento. Abençoa a nossa querida Universidade Presbiteriana Mackenzie, guardando-nos pelo teu amor, pelo teu poder, pela tua graça e pela tua misericórdia. É o que eu te peço em nome de Jesus Cristo, Pai. Amém. Deus abençoe a todos. A Rosane Welsh, ela é diretora executiva do Master em Roteiro e TV da Stephen's College. Ela é roteirista, é, ela assinou é, vários programas de TV, inclusive. Ela é escritora e publicou alguns livros e ela trouxe, né? Uh, the woman. Was, when woman wrote Hollywood. Então, é, também tem um trabalho muito forte é, em busca das mulheres que roteirizaram, né? Porque a gente sabe que a história é, do cinema é uma história de homens, né? Até alguém falou, ah, o Jorge Sadu esqueceu as mulheres do cinema, né? E existem e ela faz um resgate bem interessante sobre isso. Ah, e ela, inclusive, ela tem uma. Depois vocês procuram no TED Talking. Ela tem uma palestra lá, né? Sobre the importance of having a female voice in the room. E também eu acho bem interessante para vocês verem. Eu vou passar a palavra para a professora. E vamos dar um aplauso para ela. Thank you all very much. I apologize that I will speak in English because we do very bad in teaching languages in the United States. So this is the best that I can do, but I appreciate very much the translator who will help us all this evening. So thank you all for coming. We are here to talk about why researching screenwriters is important. And I think it's a very important thing. I've been teaching it for a while, and I was in fact a screenwriter myself for a while. Uh, as a writer in Hollywood, I wrote for these television shows. Uh, you can see me in the little corner picture there quite a few years ago uh, on uh, Touch by an Angel. Beverly Hills 90210, these are the kinds of programs from the United States that traveled around the world. And I teach my students now how important it is that they are finally being able to take in the stories from other countries. And we'll talk about the importance of streaming media and how that has allowed for that to happen as we move on. These are some of the books, as Glaucia just mentioned. My latest book, When Women Wrote Hollywood, is about very early writers in Hollywood, most of whom were women. In many industries, we find that when they're new and fresh, women have opportunity. And then as studios are created and people have a chance to make more money, the boys push the girls out. And it takes years for them to get back their previous prominence. So I'm very interested in highlighting those types of stories. I also work on the Journal of Screenwriting which publishes academic papers about screenwriters. And Written by Magazine is published by the Writers Guild of Los Angeles. And it is obviously interviews with famous screenwriters, again, in an attempt to make people pay more attention to them. Uh, as Gaussia mentioned, I am the director of the Stevens College MFA in TV and Screenwriting. It is an all-female college that we take males in our graduate schools. And I believe very much in this motto, write to reach others and represent the stories that have not yet been told. And this is what we are trying to move a new generation of students to be able to do. Uh, my college is actually in the state of Missouri, uh, but we are what is called low residency. So students come to Los Angeles, and the picture on the bottom is the Jim Henson studio in Los Angeles. And this is where the students come for workshops twice a year. You'll see Kermit standing on top. Uh, before Kermit, this was the Charlie Chaplin studio. Uh, founded in 1917 and was never torn down. So it is the original buildings that Charlie Chaplin did all his work in, and now we do it with our students. Uh, so I, uh, you can see the difference. Missouri is quite far away from California. 
my teaching philosophy. Uh, I will apologize if the translations aren't perfect. I used Google Translate. <laughs> but I think it's important that words matter, that writers matter, and that women writers matter in this world, and we must pay attention to them. I think it's important to consider writers because writer comes before director when you describe a filmmaker who can do two things. They are writer-directors. They are not director-writers. That tells me something, right? To me, that's a very important point. I also think that we have to realize that the vision of a movie cannot exist without the screenplay. A director cannot direct nothing. There must be an idea. There must be a philosophy. There must be a theme, right? There must be a story. So the writer is of equal importance. Sometimes my students who come from directing think that I am saying we should push the directors down to pull the writers up. I don't think that's true. I think they have to be equal partners in this, right? I think that's what we should remember. But we don't. And I think we realize it without realizing it. Because when you talk about movies to your friends, you don't say, I loved the camera angle in scene seven. No, you quote dialogue. You quote the lines from your favorite movies, whether they're Pixar or Disney or The Princess Bride. You know the dialogue, and that is the work of the writer. That's the person you should credit. But often when I start a class, I have students list their two or three favorite films, and then who directed those films, and then I ask them, who wrote that film? And they very often cannot name the person who wrote the film they adore. How can you want to be a writer if you don't remember the writers yourself? So I think that's a really important thing for us to remember. I apologize for the long quote, but I am very appreciative when actors recognize the work of writers. And so Frances McDormand said this uh, when she won her Oscar. Basically, she said of the writer, Martin McDonough, he did not sketch a blueprint that's an insult to a screenplay. He didn't string together a few words. He wrote and meticulously crafted a tsunami of a story. And then he let the actors play there. So she immediately was crediting the writer in a way that many people do not. Uh, I believe that stories are important because they transmit our culture around the world. Again, the United States has had a, a corner on that market for far too many years, and now we're beginning to see other stories permeate our culture, and that's only been a good beneficial thing for us. Stories have always transmitted culture. If we go far back to the cave paintings of many ancient cultures, to Gilgamesh, to the Griots of Africa, we have always used stories to move forward our culture, right? And movies are just the most current version of doing that. So why do we forget who the storytellers are? That doesn't make any sense to me, right? And I think there are some reasons that we can fix, both in our own casual discussions of films and in the teaching that people might do about what is important, right? One of the first things I've discovered in my research is this issue of unreliable narrators. Often we find when people are interviewed to discuss films, they choose not to credit anyone who will take away their own fame. So this is one of the most egregious quotes. Alfred Hitchcock, who everyone seems to recognize, you say you're watching a Hitchcock film, but he did not write any of his films. He had many other writers who worked for him. This photograph is a woman named Eve Unsell and she's from the early 1920s in Hollywood. At one point, she was sent to England to work in the studio there, and she trained this young man who knew nothing about how films were made. And when he wrote about her in his biography, he didn't mention her name so that you could research her. He only said, a middle-aged American woman. He wrote her out of history as nothing but a middle-aged woman, and yet she taught him everything he knows. So in fact, his movies are Eve Unsell movies, but we don't think that way, right? So unreliable narrators are something we have to look at when we're doing our own research or study about films. In this case, we have a woman named Jeannie McPherson and a gentleman who you may or may not have heard of if you know about early American films, Cecil B. DeMille. Mostly, if I teach this woman's work, people have heard of him, they have never heard of her. Because when he outlived her, and gave an interview to the Academy of Motion Pictures, an oral history. He said, after she was long dead, 
She didn't do much work. I did most of it. She had some nice ideas, but I was the one who did all the real work. But if you do the research, all the movies that he made that were blockbusters, she wrote. And when she didn't write his films, they did not make money. Why would he have kept her on board for 20 years of filmmaking if she did so very little? But she didn't live long enough to give her own oral history, and he did. Likewise, this young woman, again, these are all from early Hollywood because they come out of this book, so they're in my brain right now. Sarah Mason married this gentleman, Victor Herman. Before she married him, she'd written 15 films. Together they wrote three or four, and they won an Oscar for adapting a book called Little Women. And then he became a director. He directed for another 30 years. He never wrote another film. She wrote 35 more films. He outlived his wife, and when he went to give his oral history, he talked about how he trained her to write, and how if it wasn't for him, she wouldn't have had a career. That is how she is remembered in history, because her own husband was her unreliable narrator. So we really have to think about interviews when we use them as the only piece of research. Even books, like this book, Without Lying Down, is written about famous women in early Hollywood. But she doesn't write about the people of color who worked in early Hollywood. She was very focused on reviving the names of women, and I appreciate that. But in doing that, she forgot this gentleman, Oscar Micheaux, was a famous African-American, or that's the phrase we use in the United States, uh, filmmaker. And he wrote many films, some of which you can find on YouTube today, in answer to the stereotypes he saw being portrayed in the early days of film. He was trying to put out a different story, right? So, He's not written about in very many books because people aren't thinking about anyone but the very mainstream writers they've heard of. Marion Wong was a Chinese-American woman who made films in the early era in San Francisco. You won't see her in many books. These ladies uh, were also writers in the early days, and I think that we'll find out more about them in the future because they were connected to other important uh, United States people like President U Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, but no one's done a lot of research on them. No one has found that of interest yet. It's just becoming a new thing for us. So there are a lot of people out in the world. Now in this case, um, actors can be unreliable narrators because again, they have an ego. They have a persona that they have to put out into the world. And as much as I love Marlon Brando, and I'm quite a fan of The Godfather because my family's Italian, so <laughs> that was quite the movie to know. Um, a, an academic recently went through all his papers and the notes he made on scripts, and in her mind, he wrote some of the best dialogue in his films. And in her book, she credits Marlon Brando. In fact, in On the Waterfront, the very famous line is, I could have had class, could have been someone, I could have been a contender. She says Marlon Brando wrote that line, because in his own papers, he says he wrote it. But if you go back to the very first script, which was written by Bud Schulberg, his wife showed it to the academic, that line appeared in the very first draft of the very first script ever. How we credit Marlon Brando, I don't know, but that's the newest thing now, right? So it amazes me how many unreliable narrators are out in the world. Historiography, who got to tell the history matters. Hamilton is a very famous play in the United States right now, and there's a whole song about the idea that who lives and who dies makes a difference in who gets to tell your story. So you need to be better about keeping your records and making sure that they're passed down to someone. And when you're studying a writer, you need to be looking into many other things than just what a couple of people said about them. So this is one of the things I teach my students. Another answer for why we don't credit writers is that we never really credited them equally. In the very early days of Hollywood, you can see on the bottom of this poster, it says it was written and directed by Preston Sturgis, a very famous director of the 30s and 40s and 50s. However, it was co-written by two men. The other man's name doesn't appear on the poster because he didn't also direct it. Yet he co-wrote the movie. And in fact, uh, his name was Charles Brackett, and he put out, uh, his family put out his diary. The diaries he kept, they published a couple of years ago. And in those diaries, he wrote things about how he saw himself being written out of Hollywood. And he didn't know what to do about it, right? So in this case, he's talking about the poster I just had, where it says it's written, directed by Preston Sturgis. And he says, evidently, he took out every comma, as I expected he would do, 
right? So he knew he was being erased. This is the two men, uh, also now Charlie Brackett working with Billy Wilder, also a man who's more famous because he became a director as well. Together they wrote Sunset Boulevard. Uh, if you look at this poster, you can see Billy Wilder's name on the bottom in the middle, very big letters. You can't see Charles Brackett's name. He's not part of that poster, even though he co-wrote this very important film. And then also in his diary, he had this funny line about how he noticed when his own daughter eloped, he thought the trade papers would say that Billy Wilder was upset because his collaborator's daughter had disappeared. <laughs> he already knew that they weren't going to remember his name, which is terrible because he had an Oscar for writing the very first version of Titanic, not the James Cameron one that most people know of today, uh, but the very first. So the man was an Oscar-winning screenplay writer and yet does not appear in too many histories because the directors he co-wrote with overtook that fame. Right? Um, this is a, an anecdotal piece of history. Robert Riskin is a famous American screenwriter. He won an Oscar for It Happened One Night, which is the first movie to win all Oscars in all five of the major categories. And there is a story in town. He often worked with a director named Frank Capra, also a gentleman of Italian heritage, who I'm not very fond of these days, uh, because in my research I've discovered that often he took credit from writers uh, because he wanted it to be a Capra production. He wanted to be the auteur of all things. Uh, so this story, which as I said is anecdotal, is that at one point Robert Riskin was tired of hearing that the Capra touch made movies beautiful. So one day when he had a deadline on a script, he handed in 200 blank pages of paper. And he said, go ahead, put your touch on that. Because you cannot direct if there is no material to direct. All right, so we don't know if that really happened, but it's a reminder that we have to think about the work of writers. Uh, in this case, Frank Capra took a lot of credit for this film. It's a Wonderful Life. It plays in the United States often. It's a Christmas film. Uh, you can see Frank Capra's name in big red letters on the bottom over there. It was actually written by this couple, a married couple who wrote for over 50 years together. Um, Albert Hackett and Francis Goodrich. Uh, I think they're quite wonderful because they also wrote the Broadway play and the film production of The Diary of Anne Frank. They won a Pulitzer Prize for that work. Frank Capra has never won a Pulitzer Prize. I believe these are Hackett Goodrich films. They are not Frank Capra films. <laughs> So the unbalance of the credit, the lack of credit for such incredible work, such incredible craftsmanship, I think is quite sad. Uh, they also wrote the uh, uh, Thin Man movies, which were adaptations of a book uh, written by Dashiell Hammett. There was a book written about this couple by their nephew called The Real Nick and Nora. So they had quite a career. In this case, this gentleman, Nunnally Johnson, I think got it even worse. He adapted uh, this famous United States book, Grapes of Wrath, into a film. Uh, you notice on the bottom it was directed by John Ford. We, we don't see where, oh, Nunnally Johnson's name is right above it. Can you see the e itty bitty teeny tiny print? <laughs> um, John Steinbeck, the author of the book, actually said he thought the script was better than his book. He thought that the writing of the script improved this novel that is quite famous and taught in many American classrooms. When the woman who starred in the film, who married Nunnally Johnson, died just a few years ago, the obituary her very own obituary read that she was famous for John Ford's The Grapes of Wrath, and she left acting when she married the film's screenwriter. It's his wife's obituary, and it doesn't list his name, because he's just a screenwriter. He can't possibly as count as much as John Ford does. She wasn't married to John Ford. <laughs> That's amazing to me. And journalists who are writers, have made this mistake. They have dismissed writers in talking about Hollywood. I find it terrible. One time, uh, jo uh, John Ford pointed out that a particular shot that he was going to use in a script was written into the script. The screenwriter envisioned how the camera should move. And John Ford said to Nunnally Johnson, I don't know if the critics will recognize you or me for doing this work. And not only Johnson responded, I don't know who's going to get the credit, but I know I did it. And even John Ford said, I know, I recognize it. 
But that doesn't mean when John Ford was interviewed later in life, he remembered to mention Nunnally Johnson. No, 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 no. It was John Ford, right? So the problem here is we're missing the writers. Uh, this movie, also famous in the United States, uh, is called George Cukor's movie because George Cukor directed it. However, it was written by Ruth Gordon and Garson Kanan, another married couple who wrote films together. Ruth Gordon is more famous as an actress. She was in Rosemary's Baby. She got an Oscar for that. Um, she um, did several films in her early career. She did Harold and Maude, which is also a cult classic. They wrote this film specifically, and they cast it. As we had a casting director speak this morning, they purposely said, we're only going to sell you the movie if you put Katherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy in it. So they're doing the work of the director, but it's George Cukor's film. Makes them crazy. They also wrote several films together, and as I said, uh, Ruth won an Oscar for being in Rosemary's Baby. That's her very young. She was a Broadway actress, and then, of course, she worked all the way until her death. So how did this happen in a town called Hollywood where we thought we were all about filmmaking and caring about writers and all of that? Few directors are as fair as John Carpenter, who basically said, it's a collaborative effort. All I take credit for is the directing. That's the kind of guy we need more of. Right? We don't have enough of that. The problem was, I blame France, not to insult anyone who might be here from France. <laughs> But it was, in fact, Francois Truffaut. Uh, early in his career as a film reviewer, he came up with what we call the auteur theory, which told us that directors were the auteur, the author, the writer of the film. And that was the end of that. From that point on, that's how people referenced films. And this is a deep problem. Uh, he was writing for this, uh, Cahiers du Cinema, and this is where the author theory, auteur theory was born. To me, the biggest mistake ever made. Some critics at the time even said they only did it because often a movie would have two or three writers and only one director. And it was easier to use the director's name. It didn't really mean they thought he was the only one who'd done any work, but it became the way we thought. But also, this leads to the great man version of filmmaking because mostly directors were men. So we could begin to say these geniuses who had created films for us, the Alfred Hitchcocks of the world, and we forget to mention Joan Harrison, who was the female who wrote half of his movies, including um, one of them that won an Oscar, whose name just escaped me. <laughs> so this great man theory is no good. Also in America, Peter Bogdanovich is a director, and he wrote this book in 1997, which is about legendary directors, even though Peter Bogdanovich was a writer director. He privileged the directors in the history that he wrote about Hollywood. So this is crazy to me. Um, in the early days of Hollywood, there were some issues because many of the people who came to write came from New York, and they were very fancy. They thought they were better writers than that silly screenplay stuff. So when they came to Hollywood, they didn't really take their work seriously. They didn't ask for too much credit. Uh, Edna Ferber, I want to talk about for a minute. She was a novelist from New York. Uh, the quote I just think is cute. She said, a woman can look both moral and exciting if she also looks as if it was quite a struggle. So she wrote a lot about early attitudes toward fe females and sex. She also wrote Showboat, which is a classic film in the United States, and she wrote Giant, which is one of James Dean's, his last film. And she wrote this film, Saratoga Trunk, all based on novels she had written first. She was smart enough when she came to Hollywood to require the studio to lease her novels not to buy the rights, so that they had to credit her, and after a few years, they couldn't show the film anymore, because it always remained in her possession. And that was a brilliant idea, but too many other of the New York writers didn't take their work as seriously and didn't bother with that idea, so it went away. And we lost that chance to own our work. So I always, why, did, why didn't everyone do that? Yeah, Doctor Who's my favorite show. <laughs> um, so why didn't everyone do that? A couple of reasons. These guys are famous studio heads back in the day, Jack Warner, Louis B. Mayer, and Carl Lemley. Carl Lemley was of Universal Studios. They, when they created the studio system, went to the United States government, and they said that writing a movie was more like working in a factory, that a bunch of people came together in an assembly line and assembled a piece. And therefore, one person didn't need credit for everything. And that was important to them because it meant that the author legally of any movie is not even the director nor the writer. It's the studio that made the film. 
So Paramount Studios is the author of every Paramount film. Writers give away their ownership forever. If you write a movie and it has a character in it that they want to make a sequel to, they don't have to hire you to write the sequel. They own that character. And they gave it away this early in the history of the business because they didn't take the business seriously. They thought it would disappear so quickly. Right? And 100 years later, we're still talking about it. So right away, this was an issue. In their mind, playwrights were to be respected because they sold a product. They sold their play. Screenwriters sold a service, like a maid or a car wash person. That isn't something they should own. And that legal difference made the difference in how writers could have control of their work for years and years and years. Uh, at a certain point, Dorothy Parker, again, a very famous writer from New York, um, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, which we think of as the group that gives away the Oscars and has the big party once a year, in fact, started a union for writers. But the producers were in charge of the rules of the union for the writers. And Dorothy Parker said, looking to the academy for representation was like trying to get laid in your mother's house. Someone was always watching in the parlor. How could you trust the producers to give the writers a good deal if it meant less money for them? But they were trying to appease the writers. And then what happened was we had the, the famous stock market crash uh, and the depression began. And these men, particularly Louis B. Mayer, went to all the employees at their studio and said, we can't pay you the money we paid you last year. We need everyone to take a 50% pay cut, and we're in charge, and we're your employers, so you have to do it or you can't work. And many of the writers and actors figured out there's a problem here. Uh, Lionel Barrymore was a famous actor, and he said to Louis B. Mayer, you're acting like a man on his way to the guillotine who's stopping for a manicure. I clearly don't believe what you're saying to me, but I don't have any power not to take a pay cut because you're my employer. And likewise, my favorites, the Hackett's, said uh, that day he created more communists than Karl Marx. Because what the writers learned was that everyone took a pay cut, except IATSE is the union for the people who work on the set. And that had come from Broadway, and they did not take a pay cut because they had a three-year union contract, and it couldn't be taken away from them. And that's when the writers said, yeah, we need a union. That's a great idea. Let's start a union. Uh, and they started a couple of versions, and it wasn't until the 1950s when the current union, the one that does the magazine I mentioned, existed, and has existed since then, and has protected writers by making sure that credits match on the screen. In the early days, a producer could put the credit for the film to his girlfriend, simply because he wanted her to make some money. You had no rights to credit on your own film. So the Guild, that was one of the major things they did, as well as pensions and benefits and things like that. So all of that, Unequal credit leads us not to be paying attention enough to writers as we should, which is why they need to be studied more now. Also, I think education, which was supposed to help us, didn't in the very beginning, right? The earliest film school was a Moscow film school. But these guys immediately started to teach the history of film as if it was the history of directors, which made it the history, again, of great men. And that way of teaching has gone down and, uh, to when I studied this for my PhD, I didn't learn about any of these women. I knew about them from my childhood because I'd read their memoirs. And I knew they existed, but none of my textbooks mentioned any of them. So I began to unearth their names and have my students research them so that we could eventually build a library of works about them. Right? So schools weren't helping until now. You can see this little turn, you know, more and more people are doing that. But we always knew writers were important, if not the most important, because if the directors were so important, when we had the blacklist, nine out of 10 of those people were writers. It wasn't the director's philosophy that we were afraid of showing to the world. It was the writer's philosophy. It was their ideas about poverty and what it was like in America and how we needed to fix it. That's what scared the big guys. And that's why they all went to prison, right? They aren't directors. They're writers. Yeah, they all went to prison for about 10 months because they wouldn't give names of fellow communists. And it didn't even matter that nobody cared. Half of them weren't. Some were communists, and it's legal to be a communist in the United States. <laughs> right? But they were, they were mostly all writers. right? So we know that writers are deeply important, because it's the stories that matter, because those are the things that change people. right? That's what fascinates me. Um, in this time period, this gentleman, Michael Wilson, was completely censored. His movies were put out without his name on them at all. 
the movies were released and there was no written by credit at all because the studio refused to recognize him because he was marked as a communist. Both of these movies are uh, anti-war films. Uh, the first one, Friendly Persuasion, is about our civil war. And Salt of the Earth is actually a, a union movie. It's about a union of miners, New, New Mexican miners, who are on strike and the women who support them. And nobody wanted to support those ideas, so his, he just disappeared, right? If you censor the stories, if you censor the storytellers, you're going to censor the stories. And that's why we get such a small block of stories that are repeated over and over and over again, right? And this makes me crazy. Stories equal culture. So if we censor the stories, we're censoring these moments of culture. We're not allowing people to learn about these other people and their struggles, which is what art has always been about, right? About highlighting these ideas. Now, this is where we come to streaming, because streaming services are finally our chance to show all the many cultures of the world to each other, right? You can't really block them, which I think is fascinating. Uh, when I teach my students about writing, there's the quote, you should write what you know. And sometimes people think that means if you come from a family where your father's a policeman, you should write about policemen. If you yourself were a high school teacher, you should write about teachers. It doesn't mean, to me, you should write your experiences only. It means you should write the emotions that you know, because the emotions are what are universal. And that's what sells to other people. Uh, I read once that Tennessee Williams, who's a famous playwright in the United States, had said that most writers work from the emotions of the first six years of their life. And some people laughed at that, and I laughed at that. And then I realized that in many episodes that I had written, a recurring theme that I tend to go to is that to be a father is the most important job in your life, and you should take it seriously. My father left when I was six years old. Until looking backwards at things that I had written, I did not notice the repetition of that theme. Clearly, it means something to me. Everybody doesn't have that experience, but everybody has been abandoned in some way or another. We recognize that emotion of loss, and that's what we sell. So I think it's really important. Uh, one of my favorite examples of how important it is to, to see culture travel through these streaming services is the film, it's called Coco in the United States, it's called Vivo here. Uh, when my cousins, my cousins are from Sicily, my grandparents immigrated to the States, the United States from Sicily, and their relatives stayed behind, so I'm, I'm related and, and connected to, to third and fourth cousins who live there. They came to visit me at Christmas this year, and uh, we were discussing Halloween, which I laughed at because I noticed some Halloween decorations in places I traveled around town today. Uh, and my cousin said, in Italy, Halloween is not very important because, of course, being a Catholic country, what is important is that this is the day of all souls, and so it's a religious holiday. Only in, you know, only in Italy is that important. And I said, oh, haven't you ever heard of the Day of the Dead in Mexico? And she had not because in Italy they haven't studied Mexican culture. So I mentioned this movie, which she had never seen, but her 10-year-old son had seen it. The problem was, on Netflix, it was only running in English or Spanish, and they're Italian. But their 10-year-old is studying Spanish in school. So at my house, we turned on Netflix. We watched the movie in Spanish with English subtitles, to remind me, because I'd seen it, but I wanted to remember the story. And any time the Italians lost track of the Spanish language, we would pause, and the 10-year-old would translate the Spanish into Italian, and we'd all catch up and continue. And in that way, they learned the story of the, the Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos, through this movie. And they were so moved by the theme of the movie, which, again, is such a universal theme, that we should honor our ancestors, and that we owe it to them right, to live up to their history. It was a beautiful example of what Netflix is capable of doing, what streaming services are capable of doing for us, and how important story is. Previously, in the United States, the only way we could see a movie from Brazil would be if it won an Oscar, or if it was nominated for an Oscar, right? And these are the only films that had wide release in the United States before Netflix because you would have to go to a theater, you would have to be the kind of person who liked to see international films, who were willing to read subtitles. I notice my son is 21, and I notice in his generation, 
there is more of a comfort with reading subtitles. He watches, because of Netflix, a lot of Japanese anime, a lot of movies from around the world. He doesn't mind. About 10 years ago, before Netflix, if I assigned an international movie, and I would often assign some Italian films to my film students, they would complain because reading the screen was boring. Now it's become more acceptable so that we have this opportunity. So until Netflix, this was the only way that in the United States we would have been exposed to any of these films except Kiss of the Spider Woman because that was a co-production between Brazil and the United States. So it you know, won some Oscars and we knew about it. That's why these services are so important to what we're going to be able to do in the future because so many films are now co-productions with Netflix and they know they want to keep this worldwide audience because soon we'll have the Disney streaming channel and we're going to have an NBC streaming channel. There will be too many of those to pick from. The one thing Netflix has going for it is it's done co-productions with so many countries so people can have an interest in seeing their stories more than repetitive Disney stories, as much as I like Disney. <laughs> After a while, I don't need to see Aladdin filmed by 47 different actors again and again and again. So I think it's really important. And so even when I was preparing and thinking about doing this, I watched some Brazilian television. I was able on my own television to simply dial up these programs and see what they were all about. And because of that, I can then share them with my students who are very interested in finding out because my students come from many, many different backgrounds, many, many different heritages, and they don't always see themselves represented on film. So the idea of seeing television shows and movies from their family's home culture is a beautiful way for them to, to keep that culture, even in a world where assimilation is the thing that more people are respecting and they feel they lose their culture. I have a friend whose family was from Armenia and they were afraid of people disliking them. So they immediately stopped the language and they didn't teach their children the language. And my friend says the only thing she has left is the food because her mother still makes Armenian food. But she has no connection to her culture. So to see Armenian films and have that has helped to regain something that was taken away from her. Um, this is a film, uh, excuse me, a TV show that started in Europe. I, I learned about it through an Italian screenwriting uh, um, colleague, Braccioletti Rossi, and it's about a group of uh, young children in a hospital and they wear red bands because they have terminal illnesses and it's about them banding together and being friends. One of the things that's good or maybe bad about what's going on with international television is that I believe we could air the original version in the United States and that enough people would watch it. But the networks still believe they need to have an American version, a United States version. I had to learn to stop saying that this week, right? Because I'm in America right now. <laughs> um, they had to have a United States version. So they remade the, the TV show. They called it the Red Band Society. And they didn't understand the culture of Italy. The, the show in Italy is all about hope and it has a little magical realism to it because one of the children is in a coma but he narrates the story because he watches his friends become friends and grow and have hope that they will be cured someday. And in the United States, we didn't get that, which is very sad. The show was actually canceled after six episodes because they focused on the grown-ups who were the doctors and the nurses. They thought the story had to be, we're gonna find that cure because that's what we do, we save the world. And that wasn't the story at all. They did, they ruined the story, right? And because we, we don't, we think nice people are boring. The nurse is the meanest woman I have ever met. And these children are dying of terminal diseases. And she's being mean to them. And they thought that that was very edgy. That's the big word I hate in the United States right now. Edgy, we need edgy programming. How many people can we kill in the next five minutes? So we ruined this lovely program, right? But at least through Netflix, I can watch the Italian version with subtitles, <laughs> so I think that's pretty cool. Um, in my own television viewing experience, I've had the chance to see all of these programs, which I never would have seen. Commissario Montalbano is the most famous detective show in Italy. Again, that helps me feel more connected to my cousins and what they're watching, and to my grandparents and the world they grew up in. I can see footage from Italy. Um, I was amazed to find that Doctor Who eventually traveled around the whole world. I'm told it doesn't play here necessarily. 
but probably geeky people have found it somewhere. Uh, Trapped was a miniseries made in Iceland. You can see the Icelandic translation on the bottom. Uh, and it aired in Netflix. And I was amazed to watch eight hours of something that was filmed in Iceland and told me about a culture I could possibly never imagine and might never have the chance to see. But because of Netflix, I've now experienced this program. Uh, and then Call My Agent, I find very funny. It's a French show. Uh, you can see the proper title, the French title on top. And it's about a talent agency, uh, just as Roger was explaining this morning, uh, in France, and how they work with actors and all the problems that happen. It's a one-hour comedy. And what's cute about it is the characters, who the actors who play actors on the show are actually famous French actors pretending to be bad people and causing trouble to their agents. So you recognize actors you've seen in movies coming in and talking to the fake agents that they're with. So it's a charming way to learn more about French films, right, in just one program. So I've been so impressed with what I've been able to see. This is actually a program from New Zealand. Who knew New Zealand made television? Um, but I have my students uh, write spec scripts, speculative scripts, which are you know, their own versions of an episode of a show that already exists, to teach the art of copying. Because if you're going to write television, you have to copy what exists, and then you make your own story. right? But you have to know how the characters sound. Uh, so I have them pitch ideas from programs they're watching. But they have to write an Ameri uh, United States show, because that's what the people are going to read in the United States. This young man pitched an episode of this show because he saw it on Netflix. And he didn't even realize it wasn't from the United States. He didn't even notice that they were using city names. from. New he didn't know what New Zealand was, really. Uh, but the TV showed him. And it's, uh, I say that we, we learn the mythology of other cultures. This is a show about Norse mythology. The young boys on the program discover that they are the reborn versions of Norse gods. And their goal is to get together with the other Norse gods and eventually go back to heaven together and rule the world. But it's adorable. And I wouldn't have heard about it except for Netflix. Uh, just in the United States, this show finished a six season run. It's from England. And we'd always had uh, programming from England because we had that in our, our national channel. Um, always brought in stuff from England because in the United States we think the English folks are smarter and more intellectual than we are, <laughs> right? We think they're, they're, they're just better because they have Shakespeare and we don't. Uh, so we like English programming. But what I liked was it taught me about a book series I had never heard of, right? So I was exposed to some literature from another country that way. Likewise, uh, this is from years ago, but this uh, book series was a TV show uh, in England that aired in the United States, which I liked a lot. Um, when I was in Italy last, visiting my cousin, he has a little daughter named Car Carlotta, which is Charlotte in, Eng in English. And he had never heard of Charlotte's Web, as neither the book nor the movie. So we bought a copy to show his daughter when she gets a little older. Uh, and it was so beautiful to see the title of this book that I had always known in another language, and then to know that they would share that story together with her. And now we have this connection across the ocean that her, their, their child and my son knew the same story, right? So it's the culture, it's the stories that teach our culture. This is a program from Canada that airs in the United States because of Netflix. Uh, and, and I always have to say, people think Canada and the United States are the same place, but we're not. The Canadians have an entirely different culture, which is often so much nicer than ours. <laughs> so much more peaceful. This is a, a police program. It's from uh, the police. It's a period drama, so it's the police in 1902 in Toronto, Canada. And so they don't have guns. And for an American to watch a policeman who can arrest people without putting a gun in their face is an amazing experience because we're far too used to shoot them up, right? So I am pleased with the idea that a younger generation of children are watching people do this job without violence. And he's the most famous detective. It's the number one show in Canada. So I love the idea that, you know, you would think that we know a lot about Canada. The other funny thing is because it's a period drama, they introduce us to famous Canadians in history, people who grow up to be prime ministers, or one was the first woman lawyer in Canada. And we never study Canadian history in the United States. So we'll watch the program, and that's how I've learned more Canadian history in my life, which I think is a fun thing. Now. Uh, again, in watching Brazilian television, 
I found Samantha, which I thought was adorable. I'm amazed we haven't copied that in the United States yet because this experience of being a child star is something that is sadly universal. Um, and I think that it's important to realize that a program can travel to many cultures because themes are universal. And that's why when we start writing from a theme, we know that it's something that's gonna work. Uh, we talked about Harry Potter this morning. It amazes me that we're talking about a billion dollar piece of merchandise that is entirely built around the theme, you have to have friends. You have to have friends you can trust. That's all, that's the, that's the theme of every single book and every single movie. And look how powerful that has been. We need that message. We go to movies and television shows, we go to stories to learn those messages. So when I watched Samantha, I thought, okay, so how does this work? Oh, you know what? Pretty universal. She wants to be important. She wants to matter in the world. That's what everybody wants, right? And she wants to be loved. That's, that's ridiculously universal. But every story that teaches that theme just gives you the details the writer had to offer. And to me, that's one of the most beautiful things because that's how we learn we're all the same. All this nonsense about borders and walls and things I don't want to talk about, it's nonsense because we're all the same, right? That's what we need to learn. So to me, the question of why has research and screenwriters, screenwriters always mattered is because of all these reasons I've noted. Also, one of the biggest things that makes me so excited is people are beginning to read screenplays as literature. And I think maybe 20 years ago, I saw a book publish the top five screenplays of the year. And I was amazed that I could read the scripts in their format on a page, right? And so the more we see that happen, somebody like William Goldman, who's very famous in the States, um, he published several of his screenplays. I remember when Rocky came out, they published a screenplay because it's Rocky, so everyone loves Rocky. Um, but the idea that now we really know this isn't a blueprint. We're gonna look at this script, we're gonna read the action lines, and we're gonna hear the voice of the writer in a way that we can't on screen because those things aren't what the audience is given, right? Um, in my family, we like uh, A Christmas Carol, Dickens' Christmas Carol, and it's been made into movies several times. And for us, the best version is the one made by the Muppets. <laughs> because in that version, Gonzo, the Muppet, gives the action dialogue, the narration that you would not see in any other version of the film. But he narrates, he walks around town as Dickens narrated. So you hear language that you miss in the other movies. So to me, that's what's happening when people start reading actual screenplays. They're seeing the craft as it exists on the page. Yes, of course, we'd like it made into a film and we want to see the beautiful vistas and we want to see actors who are wonderful. But I just really need the story. That's enough for me. That's gonna make me feel something. And that's why it's very important when we're teaching screenwriting, it's funny, people who come from a directing background like to teach that writers should not direct on the page. Don't say things about where the camera should go. Don't say how the actor is feeling. Don't talk casually. But in fact, most of the screenwriters who sell and who win Oscars are people whose voice is so recognizable. Aaron Sorkin sounds like Aaron Sorkin in everything he does. Every single piece of action is as if you're sitting there talking to him, right? William Golden did that. Most of the big names, Nora Ephron, who is a major uh, American female uh, screenwriter, their personality comes through in the lines. And they do tell the director, I need this, I need this close up, I want this moment, this is exactly what has to happen here. Those are the screenplays that do sell because a person at a studio has to read the thing and envision the movie. If they don't see it, they don't buy it, and they don't make it. So that piece of advice has never worked for me. <laughs> I threw that. So now, in reading screenplays, people can appreciate the voice of the writer in a way they were never able to before. So we see this movement going on, which is very important to me. Again, why does this matter? Because we stand on the shoulders of all the people who came before us in this business. We owe them understanding who they are and what they had to offer. In my mind, we have to honor them the same way he honors his ancestors in this movie. That's what we're all about, if you ask me. So when I teach uh, in this program, 
This is why these words mean something to me, right? So you can reach other people and represent the cultures and the stories that have not been told before. That, to me, is something that we should be very excited about. That's why researching screenwriters has always mattered. I'm Roseanne Welch. I approve this message. Thank you very much. I hear we're going to take questions, and for that, I'm going to put on these little headphones so that I can have the Portuguese translated into English. Anybody have any É, oi, tudo bom? Oi. É, você comentou sobre é, que ultimamente as pessoas têm lido mais roteiros, né? É, os roteiristas têm lido mais roteiros, e às vezes eu procuro alguns roteiros e eu tenho a impressão que parece que, que o roteiro que eu vou ler não é a, a versão é, anterior ao, a, àquilo que foi filmado, ou assim, como saber qual que é o, o melhor dos do, dos infinitos tratamentos de roteiro que eu posso ler para ter uma assim uma uma noção melhor daquilo que para mim pode ser importante pode ser interessante como roteirista enfim there are a few ways to do that you're very correct that there are far too many versions in the world Often that's because, here, how's it? Often that's because when, uh, as Roger was saying this morning, they don't offer actors always a full script because often they will give it away. And then people like when new movies are coming out. Uh, when Wonder Woman was being done, uh, there was a script originally written by Josh Abrams, who did Buffy the Vampire Slayer in the United States. And that is available on the internet because it was so bad that people put it out because they were so insulted by what he wrote. It was very insulting. It was a terrible version of Wonder Woman. So bad that the studio, they paid him, but they didn't film it. They hired an entirely different writer. Uh, and that gentleman is whose script we see on the screen, a gentleman named Alan Heinberg. Uh, because uh, Abrams was very misogynistic. It was very anti-female, and the movie's called Wonder Woman. So that version got released. Um, so, but that would be the wrong version to read, unless you want to understand what was wrong with it. Um, there are libraries in the United States uh, at the Motion Picture Academy and the Writers Guild have libraries of scripts. They are digitizing many of them, so you could go to their online space and you're able to read the ones that have already been scanned in. Uh, even then, you have to look at on the bottom, it'll tell you if it's the final rewrite, if it's the third draft. So it's nice to read different drafts of a script, especially when you're studying, because to see how something grows and changes, I think is very important. So those are some outlets. There are, again, some being published in book form. Uh, they're generally the very last version, the one that will be what you see in the film. Um, I was in the Writers Guild Library with my students a couple of months ago, and they had just received a copy of the current A Star is Born, the one that Bradley Cooper co-wrote. Uh, and I thought, oh, how wonderful, let me read this. Because in fact, A Star is Born, it was the fourth time we've made that film. The very first was written by Dorothy Parker, the woman that I had on the screen earlier. And it was in 1937. And then it was made uh, into a film with Judy Garland in the 1950s and with Barbara Streisand and Chris Christopherson in the 1970s. So then Bradley Cooper did it. And I started to read the script. And it was terrible. It wasn't what I'd seen on the screen at all. Um, and I talked to the librarian and a couple friends who'd worked on the film. And then we realized, oh, it was his third draft before the other gentleman came on board. And then the studio knew that they could make money with a movie starring Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga and with this story that has been done three times. So we know that it's a story that's interesting because it's about fame and it's about whether or not a marriage can survive if the woman is more famous than the man, which is a pretty interesting story. And particularly in this current world, because we, at least in the United States right now, 60% of college students are women and 40% are men. 
So for the first generation, there will be women who have a higher education than the men they marry because they don't need to marry them for money anymore. They're just marrying them because they want to get married, be with somebody cool and fun, right? But, but men, that's going to be change how men feel about themselves because they have been always unfairly judged by how much money they could make, right? So, so Star is Born is very prominent. So anyway, in talking about the scripts, we discovered, yes, of course, the studio said, yes, I can make money, except not with this bad script. It'll open big on the weekend, and then no one will tell their friends to go see it. So that's when they hired the other two gentlemen, and I'm so upset I can't remember his name right now, but one of them is an Oscar winner. And he came on board, and he recrafted the story to be the one we see on the screen. And that's the one that made all the money. That one is not yet at that library. They asked writers, please, to send the material, but it's not required. So it's all up to the writer. So I would certainly go, um, I, can, I can send Glaucia some links to the libraries and their online repositories. Um, and then there's a lot of, because of Amazon, there are several collections that you could probably buy in book form off Amazon. Does that help? Yay. Cool. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Oi. Tudo bom? Então, é, sou uma jovem roteirista que está entrando no mercado agora. Estão uns dois anos, mais ou menos, no mercado. Depois dessa palestra, eu fiquei muito assustada com a quantidade de pessoas que vão tentar nos apagar e tudo mais. É, vimos o passado, viu como mulheres foram obliteradas, mas agora é o momento de fazer alguma coisa, certo? E como a gente pode se prevenir de tudo isso? Como a gente pode se comunicar para as pessoas se ser vista, de fato? That's an excellent question. It's, it requires, first, knowledge. I like to teach these early women screenwriters because I want my students, when they go, oh, I gotta step <laughs> when they, when they go um, out to work, when producers say to them, I don't know if we can trust a woman to direct a $200 million movie, I want them to say, they did it 100 years ago, shut up and let's keep talking. So they will take a little bit of boldness on our part to, to speak more truly about these things. And it takes allies. You know, we always say, uh, I was on a panel with some writers, some male writers, a few months ago, and the gentleman before me, I didn't know him, we were introducing ourselves. And he was a slightly older gentleman of, of Caucasian background. And he said that it was a difficult time for white men in the business. Yeah, I have never worked on a television program that had more than one female writer, and that was me. Uh, yeah, and there were rarely African American writers. But anyway, he said that. So it was my turn to introduce myself. And I didn't want to be rude, but I didn't like what he said. And so I said that it was not a hard time for white men in the business. It was a hard time for white men who were, and I used a cuss word. <laughs> and everybody laughed. Uh, and then I said, because what we want are collaborators. We want allies. We want people who want to work together. And there are many men who want to do that. Those are the men that we will promote as we move up in the business. We're not trying to wipe them out. My, I'm married to a white guy. My son's a white guy, right? I have nothing against them. It's the men who were insecure enough to take away the knowledge and whatnot. So for instance, in Wonder Woman, uh, Alan Heinberg, again, a really nice guy. Um, he happens to be a gay man. That's not required in writing about women, but it happened to be true in his story. He works for Shonda Rhimes, who does a Scandal and all these famous uh, shows in the United States. Yeah, he works in her. He worked on some of her shows. Um, he uh, has collected Wonder Woman comic books all his life, and so when Josh Abrams did such a bad job, uh, the producer knew that Alan loved the character, and so he invited him to dinner just to explain to him why is Wonder Woman so important? What can we do about this? And in four hours of having dinner. Uh, he decided, oh my gosh, you love this character so much, you better write this movie. He did write it, but when he was finished, the studio said, you know, women are going to want a woman to have written this movie. Uh, so we have to give it to a woman right now to fix. And he said, I understand. I, I see what you're saying, and okay, that's fine. I know what I did, and, and go do that. But when they gave it to a female writer, she said, 
this is great. I don't have to do anything to this. It would be wrong to change his words just for the sake of changing them. So they went back to him and said, oh, okay, I guess your name can stay in the movie. <laughs> and they had Patty Jenkins, a female, directing it, so they thought, okay, you know. But as a feminist, I would not have said, how dare a man write Wonder Woman. He treated her respectfully. That's all I wanted. He's a quality writer who cared about the character and did a good job. So those are the kinds of people that are moving up in the business much more often. I mean, he works for Shonda Rhimes. He works for a woman who will always be more powerful than he is, and he's perfectly happy because they have a collaborative environment. So we have to seek out people like that to bond together with. We have to speak out when people are wrong. Recently, Emma Thompson, who I adore, because I adore her, <laughs> uh, she was uh, going to voice a character in an animated film made by a company in the United States which had hired a man that the Disney company had fired for sexual harassment, famously fired for sexual harassment, and he had been <sighs> egregious about it. About nine months later, this smaller company, which wants to make money, hired him. And she was already contracted to do a voice in this movie with him. And she wrote a letter and quit the film and explained that at her station in life, now she's famous enough, she's rich enough, she could afford to give up the job on her principles. And so she would in the name of the many women who couldn't give up their job yet because they were still climbing the ranks. So that kind of ally, of course, also is useful. And someone recognizing that she was in the right place to make a move like that right, is something that I truly respect. So all of this is kind of going on all at one time. I think because of the Me Too movement, as it's been called, we're, we're going to cut back on that behavior quick enough that those kinds of personalities, those toxic personalities, won't continue. And we'll be able to get more women in business, in the business of writing films. Um, and we still have a ways to go, I recognize that. We need more women who want to be executives at studios. We need more people of color who want to do that because we tend to be interested in stories about people who look like us. So that's going to be something that helps a wider variety of stories get told. Shonda Rhimes is a, a woman of African descent. All the lead characters in her pieces are women of African descent. Suddenly, she's given a space for those women's stories. And they're, you know, the classic, they're not maids, they're not, you know, whatever they had been in the past in television. So we have to open our mouths and not put up with that kind of behavior and promote other people who are good people. <laughs> Yay. Oh, here. Oi, é, eu queria perguntar um pouco do seu ponto de vista sobre uma questão é, que você é muito engajada nessa questão da autoria feminina, né, de roteiristas e até esse, esse último livro, When a Woman Wrote for Hollywood. E uma, uma coisa que me chama a atenção, que eu percebi que eu acho que, e aí eu queria que você comentasse se você acha que isso é de fato uma nova tendência, ou então se já tem um, um histórico maior disso, mais séries como, não sei se você já conhece Better Things, da Pamela Adlon, que é uma série que eu estou estudando agora no mestrado, e Girls, da Lina Dunham, e yes. Insecure, da Issa Rae, que são todas séries é, escritas e com episódios dirigidos e também protagonizadas é, por essas mulheres. né Então, tem essa questão de estar tendo esse movimento é, na televisão de mulheres que contam as suas histórias né, e ocupam esse papel. E eu acho interessante porque isso também traz uma visibilidade maior para o fato delas serem roteiristas, porque elas são atrizes também. Elas são atrizes, diretoras, roteiristas, tudo isso junto. E aí, é, até no, no trabalho que eu estou escrevendo sobre a Pamela Adlon e Better Things, é, eu enxergo essas três séries que eu, que eu citei, o trabalho dessas, dessas autoras, como uma... Tendência relativamente nova, mas eu não sei se no cinema isso também já, já foi uma tendência historicamente, ou então se agora que está acontecendo mais isso de mulheres que ocupam todos esses papéis e aí também tem essa visibilidade, esse prestígio maior por parte da indústria. E aí eu não sei, queria que você comentasse um pouco sobre isso, sobre o seu ponto de vista em relação a isso. Excellent. Um, yes, well, first of all, television is still a better place for women 
at least in the United States, to tell their own stories. In Issa Rae's case, what I think is brilliant is that she began on YouTube for free, right? Um, she knew the people we call the gatekeepers. First, you need an agent. Then the agent has to go to a studio. Then the studio development person has to go to his boss and his boss and his boss. It's so hard to get something approved that now that YouTube exists, a person with a camera who's a decent writer and performer, so this is where so many of these women do both, uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge with Fleabag had done it as a stage play, all right, and won some awards at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, I think. So if they have both talents, writing and acting, and often people do have both. There are many, many actors who become writers. It doesn't go the other way around often. <laughs> <laughs> Often actors become writers largely because they don't see the kinds of characters they'd like to play, so they start writing those things. So in Issa Rae's case, she did the brilliant thing of putting the material out for free. She did it for almost a year, as it was called The Awkward Adventures of a Black Girl. The studios all know that people are doing that. They scour the internet, hoping to find something that will be good for them. In a way, they're using the internet as a a little league or a lower level sport team going to the higher and higher. And so she was smart enough to go that route and then HBO bought her show and of course now she's on TV. Um, and likewise Phoebe and likewise Girls, uh, it was because Judd Apatow, I think, the director writer found Lena Dunham and liked her and said, eh, here's the thing, I'll support you. So there's, a, there's an ally, <laughs> right? There's a guy who said, here's a woman with a voice who's interesting, I could not do anything about that or I could move her career forward, and he did, and look how wonderful that was. Um, first of all, it's very cool that you have chosen to write about these female auteurs, if we can use that word after I've sort of messed up the word, um, because that's an example of what we just talked about in the last question, that a male who is interested in these female voices and what they're saying. Um, so I think one TV is much more, uh, and it's funny because television is expensive, but it's never as expensive as a $200 million opening weekend blockbuster movie. Those are still the world of, of guys because the studios think that's who they can trust. They want you to have a track record, but of course you can't have a track record if they never let you make a movie. So that's the stupid part. In TV, you can come through the writer's room, and if you get a job on a show and you do good work, then you move up, then you become a writer-producer, and then the network knows who you are, and then it's funny, the way that you often get a pilot, your own TV show, is not that they immediately ask you for it, it's that they want you to stay on the TV show you're on, but the budget has been met, and they have no more money to give you from that show's budget, so they say, I need you to write us a pilot, so here's the money from the unknown show that we'll give you as a raise, so while you work on our show, you'll also write another one. And if that's good enough, they film it, and then suddenly you're writing this other show. So TV has been a easier, easy is the wrong word because nothing's easy, but it has been a, a smoother path for female writers because they can be tested each step of the way. There's really no way to do that in a movie because it's this, and we film it, and it costs us all that money, and now it's a flop at the box office and we don't like you anymore. So that's why it was such a, a big deal to get Wonder Woman right. Um, and the same was true for Black Panther and any movie like that. So I think, um, I think we're going to see more of these kinds of female stories on TV because of the success of the ones, like now that Fleabag won all those Emmys, <laughs> They're going to be, and she only did two seasons, so now I'm like, oh no, what do we do, right? But before her, uh, Julie Louis Dreyfus had won six Emmys for Veep, right? So TV's always been a little more um, welcoming to women as well. Weirdly, because they think women are poor and they have to watch TV at home because they can't afford the movies, and movies are built around 14 year old boys, which is kind of silly because none of you are 14 and you would like to see other things, right? Um, so yeah, TV's just a safer place for them. Um, and television is different because in a film you can only see the best two hours of that character's story. On TV you're going to see the best hundred hours or at least two seasons of something. And TV characters, I heard this early in my career and I thought it made good sense. You are inviting the people on television to have a more intimate relationship with you because you're inviting them into your bedroom, in the TV, now you're inviting them into your phone, in your hand, wherever you go. They have to be about relationships. And it's a cliche, 
but women are supposedly more interested in relationships than men are. They're interested in aliens and explosions and apocalyptic lives, which I don't think is true. In fact, it bothers me when the studio people say that, because what I think is true is that artists are interested in relationships. And an artist can be a man or a woman. That's not a gender, that's a personality. It just happened to be that we promoted more women who happened to be interested in relationships. Does that make sense? Yes. I love your project. I would love to hear more about it as you go. <laughs> Yay. All right. Oh, here we go. Olá, boa noite. É, primeiramente, parabéns pela, pelas obras, pela carreira. E eu também estou iniciando na, na área agora. E a minha grande dúvida e preocupação também ainda é a seguinte. É, até que ponto um roteirista tem controle, se é que tem, pela sua obra? Exemplo, um bom roteiro arruinado por uma má direção e produção, ela pode, de fato, arruinar a carreira de um roteirista? roteirista? Obrigado. Isso é muito, muito verdade. One of the things writers have pushed for, and that's what a union is useful for, is to gain a certain levels of control. Another reason that there are more women writing television is writers, as I said, are in control in television. The way television works, the writer-producer, the person who invented the show, the creator, the showrunner, hires everyone, including the director. The directors come and go every week, but the writers are contracted for three years. So they are the, the core of the show. So they, ha they make more decisions, casting, all those things. In films, the director is still the one more in charge. So he can change who the actors are. So writers of higher level, if you win an Oscar, if your movie makes a particular amount of money on an opening weekend, what writers are now asking for is overseeing casting, as was discussed this morning. How important it is to get the right actor, because the wrong actor can sink you. Uh, years ago, I was an assistant to a gentleman named Ron Chousset, and he wrote the Alien movie, and he wrote um, a couple of Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. And he had written a movie that he thought was going to be a really big hit, and he was really excited about it. Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones decided to produce it. He was getting into films and wanted to put his money into that arena, except he would only produce it if he could star in it. And Mick Jagger may be a brilliant rock and roll singer, but he can't act. He can't, and some sing, well, Lady Gaga did a great job in Star is Born. Some, you know, Judy Garland was a love, Frank Sinatra was a good actor. Some singers, it's, it transfers, right? Putting out a good song makes you an actor. Mick Jagger cannot act. <laughs> he can't, it just, it is a skill, right? And the movie tanked. In the first weekend, that was it. It was, it was a disaster. And that made Ron, from that point on, require casting permission. So that is a new thing writers can ask for when they attain a certain level. I would suggest that working in television first is better for having more control over your work. Um, and then when you make a name in television, again, Joss Abrams wrote the Wonder Woman movie badly, but he writes the Avenger movies, and those are successful. And so because of his quality work in television, he was offered movies, so he jumped that way. Um, it's a lot more fluid. It used to be that movie writers didn't want to do TV because that was below them. TV was for hacks, not very good writers. But they realized there's a lot of money in TV and that you can be very creative. Again, Netflix has changed that. Our, our networks have censors as well. There are many things you can't do on the network. Netflix doesn't have that. So now creatives are very interested in working for Netflix because they're going to have this opportunity to do these bigger types of stories. So I would say that a writer would do better to start in television. And I believe, again, with Netflix, all countries are going to have larger opportunities in television because Netflix is going to want to keep doing, like Samantha, these co-productions uh, because they want more subscribers from all the different countries. That's how they're going to beat everybody in the streaming game. So I think there will be more, always more opportunity in television around the world for starting writers than there will be in movies. Movies are so hit and miss and so hard. They have to go through so many hoops before they're ever made. And then, as we said, one wrong creative choice and the whole thing's ruined. So does that make sense? I think, I think you can have control, but I think it has to start if you start in TV. Boa noite. É, parabéns pela sua palestra. Eu amei ouvi-la. É, eu fiquei muito irritada quando você falou que é, um roteirista cria um personagem e acaba que o personagem fica para a produtora, para o estúdio. 
certo? E eu vejo que quando o percurso vem pela literatura, por exemplo, a autora do Harry Potter, certo? Ela não perde o domínio do personagem que ela criou. E a gente está falando de caminhos para ser um bom roteirista e alcançar outros níveis. Assim como você citou a TV como um exemplo de caminho, certo? Para se chegar ao cinema. A gente poderia considerar também, enquanto roteirista, a literatura como um caminho para poder se chegar a, a, ao cinema, né? pensando em escrever personagens, escrevendo através de literatura, através do livro, pensando que possivelmente ele também pode se tornar um filme. E aí, através desse caminho, você não perde o domínio sobre o personagem. É isso? O meu raciocínio está certo? Eu queria um comentário seu sobre isso. Obrigada. Ah. That is a very good idea. Now, <laughs> uh, one of, pardon me? Oh, uh, I can't hear two things in my head. <laughs> uh, yes, now, in the case of Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling was so smart. And it's very interesting because when Warner Brothers bought the rights to make the Harry Potter movie, it was not yet the success, the grand success it became. It was really just getting started. Studios get offered books before they're published because they're always, the publishers are looking, if you make this movie, it's going to make the book sell better. This is just another good advertisement for our movie. So the movie was offered to Warner Brothers before she was anybody. And it's interesting because I have never read how she was able to do this, but she put in her contract that I have approval over all the scripts. Maybe they didn't care, they thought who would care about this thing, and yeah, we buy so many movies all the time, what's the difference? Um, but she got that, and because she got that, she was able to talk to the screenwriter, whose name was Steve Cloves. He did the first three movies, I don't think he did movie number four, and then he did the rest of them, because he quit after three movies because he thought he should go write his own original movies. But his son, who was about 14, said, Dad, there is no cachet in being the son of the man who used to write the Harry Potter movies. So he went back and finished the rest of them. Um, he had a very close relationship with her, and uh, he would know ahead of time which characters were going to die and things like that. Uh, and so they worked almost in collaboration, so much that she came to enjoy the style of a screenplay, which is why she wrote Fantastic Beasts as a screenplay and not as a novel right from the start. She wanted to write her own original screenplay. So it is a good idea if you can maintain that. It is still more common that the author of the novel doesn't get that right. So if they had said no to her, she would have had to, cho had to choose, I won't sell you the book, or OK, I'll sell it to you, and I'll give that away. So you might get stuck with that choice. I believe there is. There, what is nice about novelists in television, and I'm like privileging television, but it seems to be doing better work in some ways. Uh, of course, Game of Thrones, right? George R. R. Martin joined the writing staff. He said, you can have my book, but I have to be on the staff. So he was a writer on that show, and when they passed the point where his books had stopped, he was able to say, well, here's what I think I'm going to be doing, or I approve if you go this route, but I might do something different later. So he maintained control that way, as did Margaret Atwood for The Handmaid's Tale. And um, there's a couple of other writers, novelists I know, who have come into writing television when their books were sold into pieces like that. So I think that it is a good idea. Um, it will depend on the kind of deal you can make when the project is sold. There was a gentleman, uh, a, general, uh, a novelist in the United States who writes uh, mystery novels about Native American detectives on Indian reservations. And uh, this is some 20 years ago. He sold his first book. He didn't know anything about the fact that now the studio owned his characters. So he couldn't write sequel books without paying a fee to the studio for borrowing their character that he had created. So he killed off the character and came up with a new Native American detective who took the guy's place and wrote that series of novels. So it's the same book, it's just a different name of the character. So um, it is, it's not a guarantee, but it is moving in that direction, if that helps. Yay. Cool. Mm -hmm. É, muito obrigada pela sua palestra. E eu quero é, fazer uma pergunta sobre a sua pesquisa, né, do, quando a mulher é, escreveu em Hollywood. Três perguntas eu quero fazer. Uma, 
Quando você começou a fazer essa pesquisa, né, você disse que percebeu, quanto tempo levou e qual é o percentual hoje, atualmente, nos Estados Unidos, dessas mulheres atuantes, roteiristas, registradas, seja em televisão ou em cinema, mas qual é mais ou menos o percentual entre homens e mulheres? E quanto tempo levou para você fazer esse levantamento, incluindo os apagamentos e, e todas essas questões? Obrigada. Yeah. Um, yes, the, the percentages are still not wonderful. Oh, I gotta do that. Uh, generally, um, when I started, when I was on 90210, there were 10 writers uh, for that show uh, in the writer's room. And um, at that point, two of them. Now, I was not full-time on the staff. I did a freelance episode. They hired me to come in and write one. It was my first job. So that's how they test you. You get to write one episode. If they like it, they hire you the next year. Except that's when the show went off the air. So, <laughs> um, so they had two women. They actually did, but partially they did that because they had so many female characters. They felt that they wanted to address that. It was not typical. Um, I started, uh, I was actually a high school teacher when I left college, and then I moved to Los Angeles to be a writer, and I had to be a secretary first in order to learn how the business worked and all that. So I was a secretary on several shows for about six years, uh, and in none of those shows, none of them had a female writer. Uh, at one point, there was a push from the guild and from the, the studios to say, hey, we should token show that we're hiring women, why don't you interview a few? And I watched some very sad interviews where um, some men who were feeling unprotected, like they were going to lose their positions, asked some very insulting questions uh, of women when they interviewed them. And, and then the women would leave the room and I was taking notes and they would, they would rank them based on how they looked. And could I stand to be in a room with that woman for 10 hours a day? Is she too ugly? Is she too pretty? Is she too whatever? Not what their script was like. So it was pretty bad. Um, and then when I started writing on TV shows, I would be the only woman, um, untouched by an angel, there were two of us, one was an African American woman. Um, and now, women creators are of course doing a job of hiring more women. So there's a show on uh, the Stars Network that a friend of mine works on, it's called Vida, and it's the story of three uh, Mexican American women who inherit a bar their mother owned in their home neighborhood. So they have to come from other places in the country where they've moved and to their hometown, Los Angeles, and run their mother's bar. And that staff is entirely female and they're entirely Latin American women. Uh, that's the only show I've ever heard to do that because the woman who created this show said, this is my chance to offer this opportunity to other women who want to move up in the business. Um, so it is getting better. I know uh, the Writers Guild has a uh, a committee that is designed to get more diversity on staffs and it's run by a gentleman that I worked with and he said again the difficulty is the studio he had a new show a couple of years ago and he went to the studio and said I must read uh, this percentage of women's scripts this percentage of scripts from African Americans that sort of thing and they kept sending him scripts by guys they'd already hired who happened to be white guys and he had to call again and say this is not what I want I want this and it took him arguing with them before they finally sent him enough material that he could find and he made sure his staff was two, two, and two, basically. Um, so the creators have to make an effort and the Writers Guild sometimes complains we don't hire enough writers, but the truth is the writer producers on television are members of the Writers Guild. It's us not doing it for us. So we have to change our mindset and provide that. Um, so, so it is getting better. Um, there is a hashtag on Twitter called uh, show us your room. And it is uh, writing staffs have taken pictures of themselves around their table if they're diverse enough to show that. So it was started by someone who said, look, my staff is 50-50 or whatever it was. What's your room look like? And the only people who put pictures up are people who have a diverse staff. The staffs that are still all white guys aren't taking pictures. <laughs> but it was a movement to get that idea out there. So again, it's changing. It's changing faster now than it was 10 years ago. But it's still a friend of mine. Uh, the Writers Guild also has a program called Diversity Hiring. And the Writers Guild will pay the salary of the writer who comes from an underrepresented group, usually an African-American or maybe a, a, a Latinx person. 
and they'll pay their salary for a year. And so shows will hire. It'll be an extra person in the room to talk about stories, and they don't have to pay for it. Great idea, except when the year is up, the hope is that they will have enjoyed that person so much they will offer them a real job the next year where they pay for it. But they don't. They say, thank you, you're done, and they get a new person that somebody else pays for because it's cheap. And so a friend of mine was interviewed a couple years ago. They had read her script. Uh, they didn't know what her ethnicity was. They had read her script. She came in for the interview, and the first thing that the gentleman who was hiring said to her was, oh, I've already hired my diversity person. Thanks anyway. Didn't even sit down and have the interview because in his mind, he'd already hired a black person. Why should he talk to another one? Yeah. And she was like, what do you do? Do I complain about that and then nobody's going to hire me because I'm the girl who complains all the time? Or do I just suck it up and go home and hope the next person I meet doesn't have that attitude? So that still exists. And unless, unless somebody else hears about it so they tell that person he can't behave that way, I don't know how we change it. But if you don't have the power to tell the person not to behave that way, then we get into a cycle. Does that help? Boa noite, meu nome é Felipe. É, eu tenho duas perguntas. É, você citou aí é, uns exemplos do passado, como os roteiristas não eram muito valorizados, muito creditados. E eu lembro da greve dos roteiristas de 2007, que afetou muito a indústria né, da televisão. Eu lembro que muitas séries foram canceladas. É, a qualidade caiu muito. Perdão, caiu muito. E eu queria saber hoje como é que a indústria dos roteiristas na, na indústria, os roteiristas na indústria da televisão americana, hoje em dia, se eles são valorizados, se existe algum tipo de novo surgimento de alguma greve, se, alguma, se existe alguma insatisfação por parte dos roteiristas atualmente no mercado. E a minha segunda pergunta é relacionado ao Brasil. Eu não sei se você conhece, nós temos aqui no Brasil uma cultura muito forte sobre novelas, telenovelas. Sim. Yes. Yes. E acredito que lá nos Estados Unidos tem só alguns, alguns casos né, de telenovelas, General Hospital, né, da ABC. E eu queria saber, a minha segunda pergunta era como era o seu processo para escrever um episódio de uma hora que vai ao ar é, semanalmente, e se você aceitaria fazer um, um, um desafio de participar de uma novela cuja você precisa escrever para ir ao ar todos os dias, todos os dias, durante meses. I love soap operas. <laughs> I grew up watching them with my grandmother. Um, and I, when I teach writing, sometimes I have had uh, students who were writers of soap operas in the, sta in the United States. Uh, the problem is, again, with arrogance, there's an I there was an idea that movie writers are the best, TV writers are second, and soap opera writers are the bottom of the barrel because that stuff's just silly nonsense. So these writers wanted to write sample scripts for an evening drama so they could try to get jobs and move up the ladder. But what amazed me was they were so good that they didn't need me to teach them. They just needed someone to clean up their reputation, which I found ridiculous and insulting. Um, the thing that they did that impressed me so much was that every piece of dialogue, of course, is so important. And it has to be delivered in a beautiful way, but deliver information without being boring exposition. And what a soap opera writer, or a telenovela, right, they can say the same thing five different ways, all beautiful. And so when I was reading their work, I would always say, this is too long, because they were used to always explaining. And my friend, when I knew you seven years ago and you had your unwed baby and all that sort of thing. But I didn't know what to tell them to cut because every way they tried to say it was so beautiful. I didn't want to lose any of that good language, but it was the wrong style. I, it couldn't go that way. So um, I think soap operas are great. I think we're realizing, of course, we've had quote unquote evening soap operas, and those are somehow more respected. I don't know why. Um, it's, a, it's a genre that 
comes and goes in the evening out of popularity. When it's popular, everybody's desperate to do it. One of my good friends actually had written on um, a few evening soap operas and then a few daytime ones. And then a Russian production company had come to the Writers Guild. And they wanted to have an evening soap opera in Russia. Uh, and they wanted an American writer who could speak Russian, who had written on soap operas, and who had taught because they were going to uh, hire a group of Russian writers and they wanted this person to teach the Russians how to do soap operas because they didn't know how. And my friend had all those qualities except she only spoke an itty bitty bit of Russian, so she faked it. <laughs> and they hired her. And she lived in Russia for three years and she created a program called My Anastasia, which was the number one evening program in Russia for those couple of years. Uh, and she had to teach them uh, I always thought it was adorable. She wrote a scene, it was a period piece, and there were some knights and they were fencing, right? And at the end of the scene, they took off their masks, they took off their fencing attire, they had bare chests, and then they put on their lovely shirts and buttoned them. And the, the Russian writers said, the scene is over when the, the fencing is finished and we know which man won. And she said, no, no, this is a soap opera. The scene is over when the women watching get to see the men's chests. So it's a style, right? Um, so it's a style, like any style, it has things you have to do. Uh, and she knew it very well and she did quite a good job. So I think we're wrong when we diminish that talent. I do think we've borrowed some telenovelas from Mexico that we now have produced in the United States. A show called Ugly Betty was once a telenovela. In, so they're recognizing the value of that style. So that's moving up. Um, as to the union, uh, we have another contract coming up. We, every three years we have a new contract. One of the things that, one, I do think writers are becoming more valuable, uh, and that again goes to Netflix because you've read the deals, they're giving Sean Ryan, they're giving all the, um, um, Ryan Murphy from Glee and Pose, they're getting like five million dollar deals to come work for Netflix. So Netflix recognizes that stories are what people come for. In fact, Netflix doesn't tell you what their ratings are, but they know what most people are watching. And the funny thing is, a friend of mine who works over there said, the number one show on Netflix is not anything new, it's Grey's Anatomy, Shonda Rhimes. The reruns of Grey's Anatomy are watched more than, in the United States, more than any other thing Netflix puts out. They get award nominations for some of their uh, more interesting shows, but the big stuff is, it, it, the new word is comfort TV. People want to watch what they already know because it's comfortable. It's like listening to a song over and over again. So Friends also was highly popular on Netflix, but now Warner Brothers is stealing Friends back to start their own streaming service. So it'll run on that one. So, um, so I think that Netflix is showing how important writers are because they know that it's creating characters people love that will keep them paying the subscription fee that will keep Netflix profitable. So I do think that's changing. The Writers Guild, um, the problem, with Netflix is one thing the Writers Guild fought for years was to get residuals when shows were rerun. And now on Netflix, there's no such thing as a rerun. So all that money, whenever we did a one hour show, like 9 Inch 1 you got paid for the first script you wrote. Uh, and back then it was like $18,000 for one script. When it reran in prime time, you got 100% of that fee, so you got a second $18,000. And then it went into what used to be called syndication, where it was smaller channels, and they would rerun shows every night. And there, they had a formula where you would get money, the first time they used it, you would get 80% of the 18,000, and the next time it would be 65%, and we keep moving down like that. The Writers Guild fought for years, because whenever you wrote a piece, if they kept reusing it, they'd keep selling advertising against that piece, but you weren't making any money. So we finally won the residual battle, only to lose it to the streaming services, which don't have reruns. So now that thing that we struck over and took all that time to, to achieve won't matter to the next generation of writers. What I think will be okay is that Netflix is making so many more openings for writers that even if they get paid less money, it's still going to be enough money to live a happy life. We were getting paid too much back in the day, right? I always used to think when I was a high school teacher, I made such little money. I would have done TV for the money they paid me to be a high school teacher because I loved writing TV so much. The idea that we pay outrageous fees and you're having a good time seems ridiculous. So I think we'll have more opportunity because of, there's something like 415 
narrative programs just in the United States alone, between Hulu, Netflix, all the, all the cable channels, everything else. There's a lot of jobs now. They're all paying a little bit less, but you can buy a house on the money, so I don't know why anybody's complaining. So I do think that we're seeing more value for writers. I think the union is doing good work. They don't know what to do about Netflix. I don't know if they'll solve that. Um, and, and I think telenovelas are cool, and I think that they are always a genre that will continue to be successful all over the world.